Uh-oh. Okay, we haven't covered that much yet, but <laughs> the recording is started now. We're a few minutes into it, talking about learner-centered design. The PowerPoint will be available to anyone watching the recording who might have missed the first few minutes. My apologies. So getting back into this, um, in a virtual environment, it might be time and place that you're talking about. You might be wanting to design um, an asynchronous learning experience for folks um, so they can have more flexibility with time when they're connecting. Um, the idea of flexible student groupings, basing your grouping of students on need versus necessarily grade level or academic skill, but more. Did you mute me, John? <laughs> well, did I? I'm sorry. <laughs> it was said I got muted by host and you're the only other one. So <laughs> I was like, wait, I'm muted. Um, Yes, so anytime that you can kind of use flexibility and student grouping, try not to keep things too rigid, try to um, open them up a little bit, allow students to learn from each other at multiple levels when possible. Um, and then this idea of high impact practices. So explicit teaching of skills and strategies, discovery-based mini lessons, expanding room for student talk, um, regular student conferencing, kind of having them work together collaboratively and um, anything that you can do to build in the moment by moment formative assessment assessments. So those like knowledge checks and um, check marks so that students know that they're kind of on the right path as they're progressing through their learning. Another piece of learner centered design focuses on engagement, access and rigor. And again, um, this PowerPoint will be shared out and these images are clickable. So when you click this image, it will take you to the report that talks all about this stuff in great detail. It's a really phenomenal article. So um, we just kind of pulled a few images from it and some key points. But if you're really interested in digging into these components, that resource is phenomenal. And you can get to it just by clicking on either one of the images, either the one in the previous slide or this slide. So when you're kind of designing a learner-centered experience and you're thinking about engagement, access, and rigor, you want to have units that are designed around inquiry-based learning, competency-based cycles, and that kind of incorporate the pedagogical things that most of us are already familiar with, with that idea of, you know, um, moving towards application and creation. And so anything that you can, uh, again, talking about that formative assessment piece, using assessment as learning, that formative assessment will help students to kind of gauge what they might need more assistance with, where they are in the process, and know that they either need to reach out for more support or that they are um, doing well. So building in those um, opportunities for them to learn from self-assessment can be really helpful. Um, modularizing and well scaffolding. Uh, this spans pretty much any type of conversation of instructional design for um, online learning. You want things to be modularized and scaffolded because you have um, limited cognitive load as well as um, the medium of the technology can impact what learners are able to digest in one sitting. As I'm sure you have experienced, even an hour long um, webinar can be really hard to absorb the material that's in it. We throw a lot of material at everyone in our Remote Learning 101 series. So a lot of times we try to make sure that we're providing that ability for people to go back through and pace themselves if they really want to dig in deeper. So anything that you can do like that for students is a best practice. And then this final piece of being culturally, culturally responsive and UDL inclusive. So when you have units that are designed to be culturally responsive and reflect the principles of universal design, then students are being able to have meaningful choices and build upon the strengths and interests that they already have. So, um, and as well as their identity, you know, not assuming that all of your students are coming from the same cultural background can be helpful in trying to consider um, how to make a unit that is culturally responsive. And again, there is more information on each one of these um, within, this, was it, within this article. So feel free to check that out in more detail. <clears throat> the final piece of kind of big, big things to keep in mind for learner-centered design is to check assumptions. 
And so to kind of go through that process, we chose the idea of digital natives because there's a lot of assumptions that are made about students who were so-called born with a device in their hand. You know, they, they have had access to technology from day one. And so there are some things that are assumed about them that are not necessarily true. So there's the assumption that digital natives understand all things technology, are better at or prefer multitasking, that they prefer work that is heavily paired with technology, and that they let technology control their lives. When in reality, digital natives do not have an inherent understanding of technology. It's not a magical thing that because they have a device on day one that they just know how to use it. So um, keeping, in that, keeping that in mind can be really helpful in trying to build those scaffolding pieces in the instruction because you wanna, you wanna remember that they don't have an, un, an, an <laughs> doing terrible with speaking today. They do not have an inherent understanding of the technology. They still need to learn those processes just like everyone else. Because somebody knows how to navigate a smartphone well does not mean that they know how to operate a computer sufficiently. So keeping that in mind is really helpful. Digital natives are not significantly more skilled at multitasking. This is a misnomer. Technology does not necessarily increase multitasking. Um, there's a lot of research on multitasking and whether or not it's effective. So if you're kind of wondering about those kinds of things, there's all sorts of resources online to talk directly to that piece. Digital natives do not always feel that technology makes work better. Sometimes they might, but they do not always think that. It's not just a guaranteed like, oh, if I include technology, then I'll be, I'll be reaching my students because they're digital natives. You know, that's not, those aren't the types of logic that you want to be going through. And I think I, I, one thing to interject there, Emma, I did put in the example of online assessment because I think this is often something that we'll see is if students are getting on and doing testing, they're often doing it online. It does make things easier, but a lot of students, I mean, just because it's online doesn't mean that that's exciting. And I think another nice example is um, reading. Some, I mean, people across the spectrum prefer reading books that they can hold at their hands and adapt adapting themselves to e-reading really takes some time and for a lot of kids they just they don't prefer that that method it takes some time for them to get used to it so don't necessarily assume that kids are like especially with reading i think is a great example with younger kids don't necessarily assume if it's an ebook that they're going to be intrigued by it just because it's on a screen <laughs> that is actually a great example i think both yeah. of those examples are you know that's kind of at that substitution level of SAMR as we've talked about before. So yeah. kind of thinking about the purpose is, it can be really helpful. Um, so then that last piece is just the idea that um, digital natives may not let con technology control their lives, but they do allow technology to augment their life experiences. So they've kind of understand where technology can enhance their life experiences and have allowed that uh, allowed that technology to come in and, and create that augmentation. So it's less about control and more about kind of that choice that's been involved there. So this is, I just want to kind of clarify that this is a good process to use with any type of assumption that you might make about your class or about your students. Um, if you find yourself having those kinds of thoughts, it can be helpful to walk through this process because then you can kind of look at if you're having any type of biases or misunderstandings, and then you can try to help check yourself and make sure that you're coming from a place of understanding and caring. And, okay, so considerations for learner-centered design. This is kind of just recapping on some of the things we just talked about. So designing for multiple learner modalities, integrating high impact practices, using assessment as learning. I think that's a really big one that is often overlooked. Designing lessons that are culturally responsive and align with UDL and remembering to check assumptions. So that's a lot of information. There are some resources in there so that you can explore learner-centered design. Thankfully at the core, it's a pretty simple, uh, it's a pretty simple, oh my gosh. It's a pretty simple idea. <laughs> Apparently I'm not gonna come up with the other word there. Concept. Thank you, concept. I knew it was a C, but I was like context, like that's not right. You can tell I'm just like exhausted. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's helpful context. And then um, 
you can dig as deeply into that as you want by kind of exploring those resources. So next we're going to talk a little bit about learning modalities, um, most commonly known as learning styles, although that name is not a super popular name amongst people. I'm going to preface this conversation by saying that this is not about choosing a learning style. This is about using the learning styles so that students can have choice and options in their learning experience. So we're going to start with VARC, which I'm sure that most everyone on this call is familiar with, which are the visual, audio, reading and writing, and kinesthetic learning styles. So Fun fact, there are more than 70 recognized learning styles. So these are what I would consider your baseline. These are the four styles that you always want to be considering when you're designing learning experiences. If you can think about the other learning styles or scaffolding out wider and wider, then that's great. But these are the four that should really be given conscious consideration when you're designing any virtual learning experience. So we're gonna talk a little bit about each one and um, basically kind of give some consideration to, to each one and how you might use it or how you might leverage it. So when we're talking about visual style, these are people who learn by drawing, by viewing images, they're very visually based people. By watching videos, things of that nature really um, appeal to, to these, this learning style or learning preference. So integrating visual representations of information whenever possible. When you're talking about data and research, consider including visuals like tables, charts, and other graphics. Use a digital whiteboard to encourage students to sketch, draw, and outline their thoughts in visual ways. You can also use a whiteboard to um, draw out the concepts that you're trying to share with them. Um, so just providing that, uh, that's like a replacement or substitution, kind of as I refer to you know, you would generally white, write on your whiteboard in your classroom. So this is just kind of a different way to reach that visual component in a, an e-learning environment. Um, and consider process time for visual materials, ensuring sufficient time for students to process the visuals. One of the things that can be overlooked with visual learning is that there is that time that people need to kind of, to take in the image, to process it, and then to try to evaluate what they just experienced. So that is, does take a little bit of um, built-in time. Moving on to audio, these are people who learn best from listening to lectures or for, um, they respond to all the patio, patio casts, podcasts, audio books. I swear I can speak English. Um, so consider involving students in the class lecture whenever possible, asking questions that allow students to express their thoughts in a verbal response. Um, creating group discussions that are going to aid in auditory and verbal processing of content. Scaffolding in those, you know, how did this make you feel? What did you think about it? What stood out to you about this? Some of those guiding questions can really help to bring out that verbal processing of content. Consider including audio clips, podcasts, videos, and other audio forms of learning. If you're going to have a written document, is there an audio version that you could also include? Um, I think one of the things about these four learning styles is that it's about variety. Your students may not learn everything in an audio way, but they might learn certain things best in an audio format. They might learn certain things best in a visual format. So anytime that you can kind of build these four components into each thing, then you're providing variety and choice, which is great for a remote learning experience. Moving into reading and writing, I think this is probably the learning style that is most familiar to people. Um, this is the most conventional learning style. And um, you can create opportunities for students to engage in meaningful academic research, provide meaningful interactions with text-based materials, and scaffold the writing process into classroom activities. So making space for drafting, revision, et cetera. Um, their writing doesn't always need to be a graded thing. It could just be, you know, a space where if they would like to write something and reflect on something that they have that space to do it in. Um, and that's just another way that they can process their learning. And then the fourth one is this kinesthetic style. 
Um, kinesthetic learning is all about movement. So those fidgety students that you have in your class are probably really well suited for a kinesthetic learning experience. Um, some of the things to keep in mind in a virtual environment are to provide opportunities for students to recreate information from a lesson. So I have an example here. If you're talking, if you're in a math class and you're talking about fractions, then perhaps you could give them a task where they work with their family to create a, build a bake a cake or something like that. So they're, they're applying that knowledge in a physical, tactile, kinesthetic way so that they're getting that movement in, but they're having to look at the fractions and it's very visual as well. So um, just keeping in mind some of those activities that could bring in more than one of these in the process. Like that would be one that has, it has the visual component and it has the tactile component in it. So when you're working on memorization and retention, um, encouraging students to have a repetitive movement with that can be helpful for them. If you have students who have a really hard time sitting still, but you're trying to help them with say multiplication tables, which I feel is probably a really out of date <laughs> reference at this point. But um, if you're using like memorizing multiplication tables or memorizing vocabulary words, you know, what, what, could they do that would be a movement that would help them? So, okay, you're gonna do a word and then you're gonna, you know, jump in place or you're gonna take a, a walk around your chair or, you know, some of these things to try to help the, get that movement in when you're trying to work on some of these repetition tasks that students can really check out of very quickly. Could help to keep them more engaged. Um, and incorporating learning games that involve multiple steps and encourage students to get up and do things. So we've talked a lot in some of the younger grades about like scavenger hunts where they're supposed to go around their house and collect some of these different things and that gets them up and moving and then they have to come back and kind of debrief about the experience. So things like that can really help. If you can't actually get them up and moving physically, then how can you kind of have them have that feeling of movement through a virtual experience. Um, some of the ways that you can do that would be to, uh, we'll provide some strategies in a little bit of making some interactive um, assignments and stuff so that there's that feeling of movement as they're going through something. And okay, so why and how is this useful? Leveraging VARC can increase discussion and development of student made metacognition, which if you're not familiar with, is the idea of thinking about one's thinking. So letting students know about these different learning styles and kind of how they can navigate them, how they can use them to their own advantage. When a student knows how they learn, they can have more success with studying, they can have more success with retention because they realize, oh, well, I'm not paying attention to this. It must be because I need to try approaching this a different way. You know, I have had that experience before where I'm trying to read a book, but I just am so distracted that I can't make it past the first paragraph without rereading it 50 times. But if I put it in an audiobook and I put it in my headphones, then I could bebop around the house, do some housework, something like that, and I'm moving, but I'm very much engaged to my headphone and what is happening in there. So I'm able to digest the material without having to sit still and actually read. So you can really kind of help students to, to navigate their own learning by um, empowering them to understand these different learning preferences. Um, using VARC to plan for accessible lesson unit and design. If you are accounting for each one of these learning styles in your lesson design, you're gonna be very much closer to the principles of universal design for learning and creating an accessible learning experience for all of your learners. So it's a great launching point. And integrating VARC options into learning activities to provide student choice and variety. One of the biggest things with student engagement in remote learning is that idea of agency, that intrinsic motivation. They have to want to learn. So anytime that you can incorporate that choice and variety, you know, oh, you're struggling to, you know, sit through this video. Why don't you listen to it via audio instead? Or, you know, providing a, an alternate way for them to try to reach their goals. This is a really great tool for trying to do that. Okay. So next we are going to shift gears and we're gonna talk a little bit about creating active learning experiences. One of the things that I like to start with when talking about um, 
active learning in a virtual environment is what is known as interaction design. And if you look up interaction design, at the really basic level, it is defined as the design of the interaction between users and products. In an educational context, your products would be your lessons, units, activities, those types of things that students are gonna be interacting with. The goal of interaction design is to create products that enable the user or the student to achieve their objectives in the best way possible. One thing that you will find if you do look into interaction design is very focused on websites and um, virtual design. It's not necessarily put into an educational context, but I find it super helpful in trying to think about the student user experience and then moving backwards from there into making sure that the design that I have built is effect an effective learning experience for them. So if you're using interaction design, they have five things to keep in mind. One is your wording. Keep wording simple and relevant whenever possible. Think about your grade level, like the, the level of cognition that your learners are going to be at. Try to meet them there with your language and wording. Visual representations. Consider icons, imagery, and other graphical elements that will help your students understand where you're going. One of the things that you'll notice about John and Mai's PowerPoints is that a lot of them have a little graphic or something that tries to provide a visual representation for what we are going to be talking about. Consider physical objects or space. What objects will the, student, will the students need to interact with? Is their computer enough? Will they also need an internet connection? Will they need pen and paper? What things will they need to gather before they can interact with this and have a good experience. Time. This is a very wide, <laughs> very wide parameter, just time. Just consider time. But the idea is that how are users going to track their progress and the time that they're engaged in their learning? How will they know that they are engaging for enough time and doing like meeting their goals and progressing at a certain rate? So time in that sense of things. And then behavior is referring specifically to how are your students going to interact with the learning? What is going to happen in the back and forth there? What might you need to scaffold in order to have them be prepared for that experience? So this is a lot of information. And so we like to try to include some resources for people who want to dig, late in, dig in later on their own time. So there's a whole host of resources here for kind of both how to make um, your learning more interactive, like having hyperlinked images and things of that nature, hyperlinked worksheet examples, um, building a virtual classroom space, uh, awesome ideas for how to leverage that classroom once you've got it built, creating interactive slide decks, that's kind of that idea of m the movement in a virtual realm, so feel free to dig into that a little bit. And then if you're just curious kind of more about the general ideas of interaction design, that's that last piece right there. So does anyone have any questions before we move on and I pass things off to John to talk about gamification? You can feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat if you prefer. I just wanna pause for a moment. Or even raise your hand. <laughs> Oh, yes. I always forget about the raising hand feature. Sometimes people don't like to unmute like themselves. While I, while I get my cursor to the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, please repeat the, um, the universal what, what, what? <laughs> ah, universal design for learning or backwards yeah. design. That, that's what I need. UDL. Oh, okay. Duh. Yeah, it's just that idea of starting with your learning outcomes and then moving backwards to the activities that students will do to achieve those outcomes. Outcomes first. Yes, 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 yes. And being <laughs> education, of course, there's an acronym in there, so. Of course. A what? <laughs> an acronym, UDL. So ah. another, another series of letters to remember. <laughs> yes, a text learning and, and are you going to have a class on that by chance? <laughs> we might. We've been talking about um, things that there's interest in for summer. So that's something we could definitely consider digging more into. I'll sure. watch uh, the calendars. <laughs> Perfect. 
Any other questions? Okay, well, if you wanna type them in the chat, feel free to do that. Yeah, um, if not, we'll have another moment for questions at the end of our session. So if you come up with something that you wanna make sure is addressed, you can feel free to bring it up then as well. And at this point, John is going to take over and lead us through some stuff about gamification. All right, so gamification, and I love that subtitle, combining work and play. So this, oop. <laughs> I loved it and then it vanished. Yeah. So the um, this Venn diagram that I set up here, I think this is a nice way of framing how sometimes we think about games in education and then also recreational games um, and video games. I don't want to preface and say when I'm talking about games, I'm not necessarily talking about video games exclusively, but including video games in there. So games being everything from tabletop games, card games, um, you know, runs the gamut. So a couple key key quadrants to be thinking about. And I think there's so much potential with game design and students being able to design games based on their learning. So I think when they're thinking about that, not only are they thinking about their content in a deeper way, but then they have to think about how do you make this game engaging for people? So sometimes, I mean, what I found is that students can often get two of those elements down pretty well, but getting all three to really get, get to that centerpiece where they're all, all aligning, that can be more of a challenge. So um, if you're working with students doing some level of game design, or if you're designing games for students, I know some teachers, myself included, love designing games for students. If you're able, you know, if you're kind of have the time, energy and capacity and interest to do that. I think these are three elements to be considering when you're trying to design a quality um, game for education. So moving along. So in terms of gamification possibilities, and this is not an exhaustive list, but on the left there, I included some that often are used in terms of participation, although students could leverage any of these and, and create any of these, but the ones on the left tend to be things that I see teachers using to create learning tools, learning games for students. Um, some of these probably are very familiar, Kahoot, kind of like an interactive trivia game as you progress through, students answer questions, you can have um, points assigned to it and stuff. Class tools and Flippity and Educandy are kind of more examples of taking content like vocabulary and making into things like um, matching games or um, memory games, things like that. So a little bit, a um, little bit more of the substitution augmentation piece there. If you're thinking of the SAMR model, um, Goose Chase Edu is a virtual scavenger hunt tool, definitely something to look at. And I know if I had not left um, working at a school when I did, that was probably one of the next things that I was gonna be tackling. So um, certainly a really, really neat tool that I've seen out there. And then Breakout EDU has been around for a long time. So there are physical kits. A lot of those, a lot of school districts I know have those physical kits floating around your building somewhere. Um, and you can either find games online, either through the Breakout EDU website or a lot of games that people have designed. And if you have the kit, the physical kit, you can actually run a game that way. But there are also digital breakouts that you can do. And again, through the Breakout EDU website, which there's a paywall there for some of the games. But if you're really, again, one of those types of people that likes doing that kind of game design, I've seen teachers do some really cool either physical game designs or um, some digital game designs. So certainly those are some considerations in the making if you wanna create stuff for students. I, I found that a lot of times if you're creating stuff for students, then they're like, oh, could I make a Kahoot for the class? Or could I you know, work with you to come up with a scavenger hunt for our class to do? I think when kids go through that experience, they often wanna turn around and make something often for their peers. Moving on to the right-hand side, 
couple tools that you can use for creation and they're very student focused. So Bloxels allows students to create, um, create games and it's not really computer programming heavy. So I found some students using a tool like Scratch or Swift, it's a struggle for them because there's so much programming involved and Bloxels gets more at kind of the design and I think kind of figuring out the fun factor, what makes your game engaging and enjoyable. And Inkle or Inkle Writer is one that I wanted to include in there. It's actually a choose your own adventure tool. So you can add in the text and kind of progress through a choose your own adventure. And it's, it's really cool. I think if kids are getting into kind of game design thinking and how you draw people in, that can be a nice tool for ELA teachers in terms of that choose your own adventure element. Sometimes it's tricky to have a, you know, how, how do you make that work technically? And I like that in terms of a tool that you can use to work through that progression. So it's not a video game, video game like kids might think of. It's very text based, but you can do some really cool stuff with that. And then the last two, Zulam on Game Salad, are other kind of examples of, um, tools that you can use to um, design games. But again, I think those are a little bit more high level, kind of like Swift and it's more um, computer programming based, but some considerations there. Moving along, did want to share some resources. Um, the top one there, Moving Learning Games Forward is a really neat article from MIT that's fairly recent, but if you're thinking about educational gaming in a larger context. I think that's a nice article for framing that. Um, my first newsletter that I did while I was at, at the department, I focused all on gamification. So I have some really great examples in there of working with students and teachers around the state and how they've been um, using gamification in their classroom. And I think a present, one of those in there is a presentation or two so some other things if you're looking at digging in with some of those. So again, some resources just in terms of digging deeper with gamification. So now we're kind of, I, I want to transition to doing an activity and I, I kind of have two different parts to this. So the first part of it is thinking about what are kids using for fun? So I think if you want to engage with students, one of the easiest things that you can do, well, in a sense, easiest things that you can do is figure out what are the tools that kids are kind of using on their own time. This works good with adults as well. <laughs> but if you find out what are the tools, what are the ways that they're engaging with technology, and then figuring out, all right, they're using this tool, why are they using this, and kind of leverage that into other areas. So we have Couple examples right there in that graphic of some apps that are very popular amongst young people these days. This is not, again, not an exhaustive list. So I think we'll be crowdsourcing a little bit in a moment here for maybe other apps and tools that people are using. Then the other piece of this is the why are they using that? So I think getting at some of the reasons why students are using a specific tool, sometimes we don't always think about that. And sometimes it's not always clear. I was uh, talking with Emma earlier. I think it's so funny that kids watching videos on YouTube, if it's somebody unboxing a toy or something like that, I've definitely heard from um, people of my generation and older saying, I don't understand why kids would want to watch a video of somebody else playing with a toy that they don't have. But I think if you kind of start thinking about why would they want to do that, what are they gaining from that experience? Then you might kind of get at the why, you know, the actual why of why they're doing that. So for our activity portion, you're going to need to get onto the link on the right hand side. We're going to be doing using a tool called dot storming. So we're going to have that bit.ly link, which we can paste into the um, chat in just a second here. But the goal for dot storming is you can get on there and vote for options that are on there. If there's something that's not on there, we're kind of crowdsourcing. So we want people to be adding ideas. So I want you to be thinking of two things. One, what are the specific apps or tools that you know your kids are using? And I'm sure we'll get a wide range from elementary up through high school. So just what are the specific things that you know that they're using kind of 
on their own free time. Not, not so much in the classroom. We're kind of thinking about what are the things that they're interested in on their, uh, their own time. Um, and then the other part of that is why are they using whatever specific tools it is? So we've got kind of two things that are going to be going on, some what's and some why's. So you don't have to add options if you don't want to. If nothing really springs to mind, that's fine. But we also want you to vote. So you'll each have 10 votes once you get on there. So if somebody already has YouTube up there, instead of writing YouTube as a separate one, you can just vote for YouTube. There's a little button on the bottom that you can click to vote for that. So we'll pull that up here on the screen. And again, that link is in the chat. Yes, I dropped it three times because I was trying to figure out what <laughs> Zoom wanted to make it a hyperlink. So the third one is hyperlinked, but the other two will also get you there. Yes. So just looking at the screen, you can see in the upper right hand corner, if you type in your name to join and you don't have to put your full name if you don't want to. And there is a chat function here. So if you were using this with kids, there is a chat piece in there just so you know. And then you can see as the participants list is growing, you should all have access to actually add pieces to it if you want to. So Emma, since you're the one driving the screen, if you want to join, then they'll be able to see the, the next piece. So see, you've got 10 votes available. So you can vote for things or you can add a card. So you can just write in text if you want to. You don't feel like you have to add in a, a fancy image. So any of this content, it can be students that you work with. It can be your own students you may have living at home. All right, we'll give you guys just a couple minutes to tackle this. All right, so I want to, because we've kind of, I, I think we've had people that have kind of added in um, some of the pieces like, um, what was I going to say? Added in the pieces of what are the actual apps that people are using. What I want you, so I did see somebody put their fun. So I want to kind of shift and add in those pieces. So try to think of what are some of the what are some of the reasons? What are some of the purposes? What are the whys that they're using these these apps? What is their goal for using? <laughs> what what possesses a teenager to use TikTok? So we'll give just another moment or two for people to try to put some of yep. those things. In. And then make sure if you're you can add a card at the top 
and then that's where you want to put your actual your actual pieces. So the chat is kind of just to offer some direction in there. Yes, thank you, Emma. All right. So looking at, looking through that list, we are able to actually order that. Um, I think I have maybe one, maybe I'm logged. There we go, rank by vote. So on your end, did it? Emma, if you click down on the very bottom where it says rank by votes. So there, that kind of gives you a sense of, hopefully now people get a sense of how this tool works. So if you're using this with students, you'd have those different items in there. We could have it locked down if we didn't want them to be adding options. So just kind of keep that in mind. You could have the options all set and just have them voting on the different options. Um, because you kind of run the risk of you might have, um, I think there were a couple in there that we had kind of duplicates of. So just something to keep in mind. I think this is a nice tool to crowdsource some ideas, sometimes make some decisions. We can look at this and obviously those top four apps, you could have some kind of larger discussion. So Spotify was one that I didn't even include in that original list. So talking about Spotify. So I think if we look at these, the top four, we'll just kind of start with those. I think one of the things you might want to be thinking a little bit more deeply kind of past today is why are students using these tools? Kind of what are the ways that they're using them? And what are, you know, what outlet do they provide for students? I think that's one of the big challenges when you're thinking about technology and thinking about if somebody's engaging in something on their own time, you know, what is the purpose of that? And then how might you use that to kind of reel them into your own class and engage them? And it can be tricky. I know some teachers would think, you know, how could I leverage TikTok or Snapchat into the classroom? And some tools work really nicely and some tools just do not. So don't feel like just because something's popular like Spotify, you know, maybe there's not a way to bring Spotify into your classroom. But something like YouTube, you could think about what are the videos that they're watching on YouTube? You know, they're watching people that have create, created, um, created videos, kind of tutorials explaining things. They're maybe learning about different areas that there just aren't resources out there. Some people just like that video format of getting information. So I think that's, you know, that's a big piece of it. I did see in the chat a couple things. So TikTok, and this is certainly a consideration based on different, I mean, a lot of the popular platforms are going to have some issues around safety and security because they're kind of open and public platforms. 
So part of it isn't necessary that you maybe would use TikTok in your classroom, but what are the pieces of TikTok that students like? And maybe, so somebody gave the example of Flipgrid. So students are much more confident recording themselves and talking about things. So I think because of that, you can leverage, you know, if they're doing TikTok on their own time, Flipgrid, you can do some of the same kind of interactions, but it's a much safer platform for students to work in. So I think that's kind of the way that you can make that shift from, here's a tool that they're using, how can I actually integrate the ways that they're using it into the classroom? So, I mean, the tool is just the tool. It's getting at some of the ways that they're using it that I think is most important. All right, so moving on to the next piece. So the future of active learning, and I think this is one of the big pieces to be thinking about as we, you know, transition into, you know, the school year and kind of school years in the future. I think there have been a lot of things that we've experienced over the past three months, and some of those things can inform the ways that we're doing our remote learning. And if we go back in the fall to needing to continue remote learning to some capacity, then I, hopefully we've learned some lessons and hopefully Emma and I are providing some, some resources. But I, I think it's important to be thinking about down the road in terms of education, in terms of technology, think about some of the technologies that students really get engaged with. So we kind of pulled together a little list and I probably just in the interest of time, we won't necessarily have people comment on this, but if you wanna add something in the chat, if there are any of, any in this list that really speak to experiences that you've had. So things like 3D design, 3D printing. Maine has, thanks to the Perlaw Family Foundation, we have a ton of 3D printers in our schools. Um, augmented reality, virtual reality. I think those are some cool opportunities out there. Um, Google, I know Google Cardboard in terms of inexpensive tool to use virtual reality, but then they also have a recording app. So you can actually record and create a virtual reality atmosphere of a sort. Robotics, coding, all of those pieces, I think there are opportunities to do some of those things working in a remote environment. And then I know, especially working with elementary kids, a lot of our robotics that we do, it's very much, you have a tool that you're working with, whether it's a Spiro or uh, Ozobot or whatever it is that you're working with. Sometimes it's building those skills and the knowledge, which you can do definitely in a remote learning environment. And the last one I want to mention is maker spaces, because um, that's very hands on and I think something that's developing and it, those can be really inclusive of all of the things we've mentioned above, but I've seen many different makerspace models across the grade span. So I think that's just a nice thing to be thinking about. So if anybody has any kind of suggestions or ideas related to any of these that they want to throw into the chat, I'm sure there'd be some nice tools that people have used that maybe could still work nicely in a remote learning environment. Yeah, Julia shared that there's a really awesome um, augmented reality um, piano thing that you can use. So that sounds really cool. It's so cool. It puts little, if you hold it in front of your own piano, like just a, a regular like acoustic piano or whatever, any keyboard, and it puts little dots where you're supposed to play stuff. Oh, very cool. It's awesome. Not totally great for actually teaching like what I have to teach, but it's cool right. for people who want to engage. So you might be wondering why we're kind of, oh, John, you're muted. So that's just a great example, I think, of you're kind of getting at what are the ways to engage students? And I think that's a really great example because even though it's not like the best teaching method, part of the challenge is getting them engaged, getting them on board. And if they're engaged, if they're invested, it's easier to kind of sneak in some teaching. <laughs> Yes, that internal motivation. I was just going to mention, if you're wondering kind of why we're sharing this with you, our thoughts behind this is that learning is going to continue to innovate and technology is going to continue to become more readily accessible. So the idea that 3D printers may not be, you know, 
available at Walmart right now, that may not continue to be true. You know, as 3D printing and things of those nature, like our AR glasses, stuff like that, as that stuff becomes more commonplace, it will become more accessible, just like a calculator was only used, you know, in companies for a long time. And then eventually now everybody has a calculator on their phone. That is kind of our thinking behind showing you some of these things, because anything that we can do to move the needle to get closer to that interaction is going to prepare our learners for the world that they're going to eventually experience. And it also prepares us as teachers to have to kind of push them through that world, because of course we're not going to not going to be able to avoid it <laughs> eventually. So um, we've only got a couple minutes left. So I just want to move into the last couple slides that we have. Um, again, with our, our traditional checklists, um, things to keep in mind when you are trying to meet students where they're at. You want to start with that learner-centered design, build in those active learning experiences, Use the principles of gamification and interaction design whenever possible and consider the future of active and interactive learning and think of ways you might prepare yourself and your learners for that new world. And so if anyone has any questions they want to toss out, you can feel free to toss it out verbally or type it in the chat. Um, I'm going, I love that little baby. I am going to just change the slide so that we have the certificate information readily available for anybody who has to jump right off. But um, if anyone has any final questions, feel free to chime in now. Another awesome time to be together. <laughs> So many of us, oh gosh, I learned so much every time I, every time I'm here, <laughs> I learned so much. And yeehaw, thanks to you guys again. <laughs> <laughs> you are very welcome. I love the enthusiasm. I've been joking with some people because I know, I know for a fact that some people are just, they're, they're done or finishing up with their school year and they just need to go and like close their computer and recharge the batteries. That is totally okay. I completely understand that. I think our goal was to get these sessions kind of recorded and ready. So if people are viewing them now, which you guys are participating, fantastic. But the other part of that is, you know, these will be recorded and people can access them whenever those batteries are charged. We're ready to start thinking about whatever's coming down the road, then we'll have, we'll have this resource ready for you. And, hopefully more as time goes on because I think as Emma and I have been going through this process we've been picking out those little pieces that it's like yep this needs some more development or this is something that we could certainly speak to you know maybe at a different grade level more specifically Awesome. Well, tomorrow we will be finishing up module two. We're going to be talking a little bit about assessment and feedback in remote learning. And we will also be doing a 3 p.m. help session tomorrow afternoon on self-recording and video tutorials. So feel free to drop in if you have questions or want to troubleshoot an issue. And we'll hope to see you guys again. Bye. Have a lovely afternoon.